of the uh, islands, the smaller islands, are privately owned. Uh, it's a place for the very, very rich. We were having a pretty smooth passage when all of a sudden we hit a narrows and there's a complex of currents in here. Some of them are very strong, the upwellings and even some small whirlpools. It's very rich in sea life with the strong currents, so as a result, not only lots of fish, but you got lots of eagles and, and lots of seabirds. Originally, it was salmon fishing that was drawing people to this area, and, and uh, I guess enough people, you know, coming up here long enough, um, just the beauty of the place is, has drawn people in. In the northern part of the Georgia Basin, we've seen an increase in recreational facilities that people have built. Private homes, summer homes. We've got a lot of people that live out here now. They're a short boat ride to somewhere where they're a short car ride to a major center. Many of us don't get to see glaciers because so many in the world are retreating. This is a real one. 12,000 years ago, the glacier here was all the way down here between one and two miles thick. Now it has retreated till it's just a small portion of its former self, but it's a real glacier. It's hard to imagine anything more spectacular than gobs of fresh water plunging into the, the salt water of the inlet. For sure this is snow melt and this waterfall, it may also be glacial melt. We can see the snow, but if we look at the water and see how cloudy it is, that indicates glacial melt from the dissolved rock that is brought down by the glacier. objects is no problem, but they're about to remove something really big and unwieldy from the boat, and it could swing around and do a lot of damage. It looks as if it's something out of Star Wars, but it actually is an important part of logging on hillsides. Those cables get strung up to big logs and pulls them in the right direction, straightens it out, and with this track, it can go almost anywhere. This is a train. They're going to load this big truck with another kind of cable and uh, crane on it back onto the boat in place of the one that was taken off. I'm getting out of the way. This is a drilling machine. In order to get to the timber, they have to make a lot of roads, and that involves drilling through rock, filling them with explosive powder, and blowing it up so they can actually get the equipment up to the site. It's fun and games to figure out what this next piece of machinery is coming on along with the other new piece is going to take up all the space that the, the crane occupied. I was hoping with the empty deck we could have some dancing going on tomorrow night, but it looks like it's filled up with stuff that I didn't anticipate. The forest trees that don't go to make lumber go to make pulp, especially the hemlock tree, where countless thousands of them are ground into very fine chips and brought down here to Powell River and processed in this pulp mill to make paper. The Canadian pulp industry used to be one of the most flourishing in the world, but the costs of production are now so great that they can't compete with other places in temperate climates where the trees grow much faster. So it's a dying industry, but here it seems to be doing pretty well. The town of Powell River in British Columbia is a pulp mill town. But they found that the cheapest way to build a breakwater to protect the inner harbor was to take old Liberty ships. They're made out of concrete and reinforcing steel. They were used in the North Atlantic as supply ships during World War II. And they make a fantastic and cheap a solution to the problem of the waves in Powell River. It's hard to know whether it's more a monument to the heroes of World War II or to the engineers who came up with a inexpensive solution to a sea problem. Whatever it is, it's strange. Here's the plane. Well, there's Guy. How you doing, hey, Guy? Good. Yeah, will this be a safe ride? Absolutely. Well, well, I, well that's just Traveling around in a boat, you don't get an accurate view of what the country really looks like. And to get that, you've got to get up high. You've got to go up in a plane. The coast of British Columbia has thousands of miles of channels and coastline. You might get the impression that that's all there is. But very slowly, you can see the magnitude of this country. 
And now things change. You begin to see what immense and rough country this is. I never realized how much clear cutting went on here. But the people tell me that the worst part of it was back in the early 20th century. OK, now we're up about 3,000. And we begin to see the higher peaks. The highest peak in this part of British Columbia is the highest peak in the whole state, a little over 13,000 feet. But it's way above us. And now you begin to see how vast this province is. We're just seeing one tiny little portion of the province of British Columbia. It looked like it would take three lifetimes to walk through all of this. We're getting high enough to where we can see glaciers. This used to be covered by a glacier more than a mile thick. But here, by 10,000 years ago, it was mostly melted. And the mountains have actually risen a few hundred feet. Now there's a glacier. There is a glacier. It has a reddish tinge. The local people warned me about that, and they said it's actually an algae. And now we can see how vast this country is. It's broken crags, crags that have been smoothed off by glaciers. And there we go over Butte Inlet. It must be 40 miles long. The portion of British Columbia we see from the boat is tiny indeed. But the combination of the working coast and ecotourism gives a glimpse of a future that reconciles industry and conservation. Much of the vast interior of northeastern Brazil is semi-desert. One mountain range rises steeply from the plains. It has created its own ecosystem, the Chapala de Manchina, the Diamond Range. Join us next time in the Americas with me, David Yetman. It seems odd to see the Canadian Coast Guard out here on patrol, but these waters are navigated by many, many hundreds of ships, some of them very large. And it's the Coast Guard's job to make sure that they are legal and that they are safe. Funding for In the Americas with David Yedman was provided by Agnes Howard. Copies of this and other episodes of In the Americas with David Yedman are available from the Southwest Center. To order, call 1-800-937-8632. Please mention the episode number and program title. Please be sure to visit us at intheamericas.com or in the Americas.org.